Um, seems to have just made my PowerPoint presentation in. Let's try that again. All right. So um, welcome to uh, the Quasi Virtual University Introduction to Snow Modeling class. Um, and what you hopefully all see on your screen is a picture of a graduate student programming in the snow. This is hopefully not what you all have to do in this class in order to do snow modeling. But um, if your hands don't go numb, it'd be fun. And I'm guessing that there's something that just accidentally clicks people that says, can you make me the presenter? Uh, if anyone really wants to be the presenter, um, maybe it'd be better. Let me know. I think it just seems to be showing up in the chat box. I guess there's something accidentally you click. Go on. All right. So um, before I jump into the class, I wanted to just say a bunch of thank yous. This class was not developed just by me. Um, it was inspired by what we called Summer Snow School, a modeling class that was taught in June 2014 by Martin Clark, Bart Nyson, Mike Duran, Glenn Liskin, Bruce Slater, Tony Rosati, and myself. Um, I also want to shout out a um, special thanks to Bart and to his student Andrew, who have really worked to translate all the lessons we did in 2014 into a purely online environment. So you will all be able to do cloud computing and don't need to travel at all. I also really want to thank Liz Tran, Ainsley Brown, and all the Kwasi staff who have really worked to organize all the logistics behind the scenes for this and for a one week in person snow measurement class, which I'm recommending. Um, I know a couple of people have already taken it. If you haven't, um, the deadline has been extended to October 15th, and you can apply to go. It's first week in January. It will be in Vermont, and um, we will go and get to apply all we're going here with real snow. Um, I also want to thank all my students who continually teach me more about snow modeling. So with all those thank yous or anything wrong, I'll take responsibility for it. Okay. So let's let's think about snow. So this was what I was reading just a couple nights ago um, by Roy McKee and P.D. Eastman. What makes it snow, we do not know, but snow is fun to dig and throw. Note that Dr. Seuss uh, lived in San Diego, so he knows about snow. Okay, so let's let's pull the other people. Um, so why are you here? Um, what do we want to know about snow? Um, if we could go around, um, people try to turn on your video and microphone, introduce yourself, and tell me a little bit about why you're taking this class, and if this nice blue box is our snow, what is it that you want to learn about snow or snow modeling? So maybe, Laxmi, you could start. See if you can get your Hi, I'm Lakshmi. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a PhD student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, so I work with like uh, Newton class from winters, like in the Midwestern states, like applying manure on top of the snow is like very common practice. So like as the snow melts, all the manure is lost, uh, polluting our water bodies with nitrogen and phosphorus. So I want to know about how to model snow, like when we have manure sitting on top of the snow, which increases the albedo of the snow, which influences the snow melt rates, which I'm curiously looking like how the albedo, snow, and the manure interact, like manure and snow interact and release the nutrients. Yeah. You might need to modify the model to get the manure into it. But... Yes, yes, Thanks. yeah. Yeah, that's the plan. Excellent. Uh, yeah. Camila? Camila? Can you tell me how to pronounce it? Yeah, it's Camila. <laughs> okay. Hi, my name is Camila. I'm a PhD student at the University of Wisconsin Madison. And I'm going to work actually with uh, modeling floods. So I'm from Brazil and I don't have much experience with snow. And I would like to learn more about how uh, snow contributes to flooding. Okay. Brent? Hi, my name is Brent. <laughs> Sorry, I have a cold. Um, I have a master's uh, in civil engineering with an emphasis in water. Can you guys hear me okay? 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, civil engineering with an emphasis in water resources at San Diego State University. Um, my thesis that I'm working on with my advisor is uh, post wildfire recovery and post wildfire uh, peak flows. Um, so I'm interested. We don't get a whole lot of snow in San Diego, uh, but in parts of California, um, there are snow. So it'd be interesting to see how that would be impacted for like post wildfire recovery and if how modeling, uh, snow hydro- hydraulic modeling would, would affect that. Excellent. Katrina? Hi, um, my name is Katrina Rabler. I'm at uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. My advisor is Dr. Steve Lohide, um, and I'm a first year master's student, um, and my project is looking at frozen ground and snowmelt, um, and how specifically how midwinter snowmelt affects groundwater recharge. So um, it's pretty obvious how this course is applicable, so I'm excited to learn about how about snow modeling because that'll be one portion of my model that I'll be building for my masters. Excellent, and our model does have uh, ground and it will freeze and thaw and get soil water in it. So I would do manure, we do have soil. Yeah. Great. Still working, I can't hear you. Sorry, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Hi, I'm Drew. I'm a master's student at Utah State University, and I was taking a physical hydrology course, and my professor isn't an expert in snow, but she recommended taking the course if you want to learn more. So I'm actually a hydraulic student, but I'd love to learn about snow. Excellent. Lots of snow in Utah. And Colin? Hi, I'm Colin Rowland. I'm a master's student at University of Wisconsin-Madison. I work on slope stability and its interaction with groundwater, so I'm interested in how snow and freezing and thawing impact soil mechanics and stability of slopes. And Connor? Yeah, I'm Connor. I'm a master's student at Utah State University, and my master's project is modeling snow and connecting it through a Parse watershed to the stream flow to try to figure out how snow melt drive affects stream flow and how long it takes. Excellent. I don't know if we have any karst in our model, but you can figure out the snow after it gets to the soil from there. Sounds good. Um, Jessica, am I pronouncing it wrong? Hi, uh, yes, that's correct. Uh, my name is Jessica. I'm a master student here in Utah State University. And my interest is to take this course because um, I have a kind of background on modeling or I was kind of consulting hydrology in Peru. And, uh, but I don't have experience to doing modeling with the snow specifically. So I want to know how they uh, calculate this snow and how this affect to when you make prediction to the discharge. Hi. And Allison? Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Allison, and I'm a master's student at Boise State University. And my research is in um, using remote sensing fusion techniques to monitor snow covered area in mountain watersheds. Um, and I'm interested in learning about how snow modeling can help us understand how vegetation affects. Um, snow cover and how when we're using remote sensing um, if we can't exactly see the snow cover underneath vegetation like trees and shrubs and things like that how do we account for it um, in our models that way uh, Joshua? can you hear me mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm a first year master's student at Boise State University and I haven't started my research yet but I'm going to be working on the snow X project and I don't really I haven't taken that many classes in snow besides like avalanche courses so I figured I'll probably be doing some modeling this year so this would be a helpful class. Chris? Hey everybody my name is Chris Meter. Um, I'm a second year master's student here at the University of Washington. Um, I'm in a coursework only master's program, um, so I'm not doing any specific 
uh, research projects related to snow, but I'm kind of generally interested in it. Um, and as far as uh, my interest in the class, I'm interested in, in um, hydrologic, mo hydrologic modeling generally. Um, and I was curious to take this course to um, get some of the details about modeling of snow and how that fits into the bigger picture of a watershed model uh, in mountainous areas that include snow. Excellent. And Megan? Hello, uh, my name is Megan. I think the microphone's working. I <laughs> am um, a student, I'm a second year master's student at Boise State working with HP Marshall. Um, I am working right now on the snow distribution with the light with LIDAR data that comes out of uh, the Sierra Nevadas in California. Um, I'm interested in this course. Um, I have some experience in the field, some experience now working with remote sensing data, so I kind of want to figure out how the snow modeling part works. And I'm also working with the USDA snow modeling group and kind of seeing, I want to learn the academics behind this, like um, how we apply the, the snow model. Excellent. Um, and I have, there's one more student, Maggie, who's not logged in and she's gonna, is it okay if she jumps in and uses my setup? Says hello. Yes. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> hello. Hi, Maggie. Hi. Um, my name is Maggie. I am a graduate student with Jim McNamara at Boise State and I am looking at snow vegetation interactions and um, the quantifying the snow surface energy balance. Um, and then I'm just interested in taking this class um, to learn more about modeling and snow hydrology. Um, I have a lot of experience with like DHSVM and it's a very complicated model. And so just kind of diving more into the intricacies of um, modeling. So, Thanks. Peter. Hey, my name is Peter. I'm a, a student under HP Marshall at Boise State, doing my master's degree right now. I'm looking at uh, temperature gradients within a snowpack and and getting continuous measurements of snowpack temperature over time, as well as um, stable water isotopes within a seasonal snowpack and how that changes throughout the season. So I'm really interested in different phase changes and and how um, cold temperatures can propagate into the snowpack and, and how that affects uh, different temperature gradients within the snow. Excellent. Um, we'll have all the temperature, we won't have all the chemicals. So the isotope won't be in the model we'll be using. So HP? Hi everybody, I'm HP Marshall. I'm a Associate Professor at Boise State. Um, I use geophysics and remote sensing to study snow. Uh, I've done some modeling in the past, but not nearly as much as Jessica. So looking to learn from her and also I'm teaching the microwave remote sensing module in next month. So I'm also trying to learn more about this whole interface. So I'll just be a fly on the wall. Excellent. Is there anybody, anybody else who is, is out there who I don't see in the video? Um, I think everybody who's listed is here. We may, we may have a few people who are relying on the video. Thank you so much to all of you who are signed on on the um, video. Last year, the video didn't work as well. And um, it's way more fun when I can see there's real people out there. So, so thank you. All right. So, um, so we wanted to know a whole range of things about snow. And so when I, I thought about this, this was sort of how I filled in about you know, globally, you know, what are the things I'm thinking about, right? We want to know, you know, the snow depth. We want to know insulation. Is there permafrost? Is there frozen soil underneath? Are there ice layers in the snow that might be predict, preventing wildlife from getting underneath the snow? How fast is our snow changing? Is it melting? What are hazards associated with the snow? Is there an avalanche risk? Are there road conditions? Um, what's the snow strength? What's the precipitation phase? Water resources, what's the water content of the snow, which is a function of the depth, the density, the extent, and the energy feedback to the atmosphere, the extent, the albedo, and the surface temperature. Um, our course will not, as I mentioned, get into um, the chemical 
constitution of the snow or the propagation of chemicals or isotopes through the snow, but we will have all of the physical parameters and temperature and density structure very well covered in the model, model we'll be using in the class. So before we jump into the nitty gritty of modeling, I wanted to kind of step back in a sky high view of, um, you know, when you start thinking about snow and all the things we want to know, um, it, it's pretty complicated. And, you know, how do we prioritize what we're looking at, where we're focusing? And as we're doing that, which models and which other data sources should we be getting to give us the best idea of what we need to know? And I want to start with something that was, you know, may seem obvious to most of you. It was kind of an epiphany for me is, you know, when you start looking at snow around the world and you start talking to people coming from different places, um, the first thing you notice is, is my snow is different than your snow. Um, and so this is a picture on the right. This is me digging a snow pit at Snoqualmie Pass with Johnston Barris. Our snow is about two meters deep. Um, it's all zero degrees Celsius. Uh, there's some ice layers in it. We've got really maritime snow. I went and visited Matthew Sturm, went up to um, what was formerly called Barrow, Alaska, and is now Unabiat, I think, um, is 30 centimeters. Um, and number one, the snow pits are way easier to uh, dig. And number two, once you look at it, the crystal structure is completely different from what we've got up here in the maritime. So right here in the middle is just um, Matthew Sturm's snow classes. Um, and he's talking about tundra snow, I'm looking at maritime snow. And you know, one thing, whenever you're listening to anybody talking about measuring or modeling snow, um, you want to first realize the person is giving you something that's slanted by their own background. Um, I had a literature teacher um, in undergrad who said that every professor teaches you first about themselves and second about their subject matter. So you know, keep, keep in um, understanding that I am coming from an alpine maritime snow background. And so a lot of the things I will be teaching you are, they're relevant to snow everywhere, there's basic physics, but are more relevant to these areas. Um, and feel free to you know, ask if you're dealing with you know, very shallow prairie snow, how might things be different in your neck of the woods? Um, just to think again about the my snow is different than your snow concept. Um, here are um, graphs that again, when Matthew and I were, were discussing, we we're trying to decide whose snow was more variable, my snow. So here's a trace. Um, these are 25 years of snow water equivalent measured on a snow pillow. It just weighs the snow by month of the year um, in Yosemite of the Sierra Nevada, California. Um, I think Megan's been to this site. Um, and then here are the trace of snowmelt from Matthew Snow, um, like the picture you saw. This is in Amnaviat Creek, north of the Brooks Range in Alaska. Um, and just you know, take a minute to look at these, these two pictures. Both are about 25 years worth of, of data. What do you notice about snow in these two locations and about interannual variations in the snow mount and snow melt? If somebody would be brave enough to turn on their audio and make some comments. Um, this is Katrina. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like the snow water equivalent increases um, in the Sierra Nevadas for a while and then decreases in the spring. And then in uh, Alaska, it just decreases generally throughout the year. I, I think part of that is that it's impossible to measure it in the winter. And so it's, it's actually they just have no no data. I think it does increase and then it's flat. And so what he's plotting here is when they were able to get measurements. So so we're just, yeah, so there's only data of the, the depletion. But the, this kind of green line here, you can see, let's see if I can do a pen or a pen. This green line right here. Um, that one shows sort of the, the typical is um, you kind of have shallow snow for a long time and then it suddenly melts here. Um, this so, so any other things people are noticing? 
This is Maggie. Uh -huh. um, it melts pretty fast and then, at least for the Brooks range, it melts pretty fast and then it kind of tapers off the rate of change of melting. Uh -huh. um, but they all really start off melting fairly fast. Yeah, and I, I think one thing you're, you're seeing that's, that's another really good observation of a difference is that the Brooks range data is a basin average snow water equivalent and the Tuolumne is just measured at a point. And so I think that last tail of measuring much more slowly at the end is a, you know, the snow that manages to stick around till the end is sheltered snow that's gonna melt more slowly. Um, and so you'll see, you'll see more of that at a basin average. This is Megan. Um, just the amount of SWE is different between both of them, their maxes which correlates with like snow depth, what you're saying in the beginning. Right, right. So um, yeah, that deep snow pit that um, I dug is it's about 10 times, right, as deep as what's, what's in Alaska. I think another, anything else people are noticing? tell you a few things things I noticed one is um, is that the the variability in the total amount of snow varies by about a factor of four in Tuolumne varies by about a factor of, of two both huge variability um, the um, the date that snow disappears at Tuolumne you can see it traces back that if you have more snow it disappears later. If you're up in the Brooks range, you can see that actually it, it does, maybe it's a little bit later if you have more snow, but it's not as obvious. Um, it kind of looks like you have snow and then it turns on suddenly and melts in just about five days. But the time it takes to melt is um, you know much faster for a sh shallower snowpack than for a deeper snowpack. Um, but the shallowest snow in Tuolumne can be the same as the snow up in Inaviat. And the range over which your snow disappears is, is huge. Um, it's, it's over a month difference in when the snow disappears up in Inaviat, and it's over two months difference in when the snow disappears in Tuolumne. So, um, so when we're trying, the, the reason we're trying to model this is that this is, you know, a hugely dynamic system in both domains. And, you know, just knowing what happened last year, you know, it can be quite tricky to figure out what's going to happen next year in either of these locations. All right. So an, another thing that it comes up frequently is sort of, all right, if my snow is different than your snow. We have some prioritization. Does my snow matter more than your snow? Um, so, so Matthew's paper that talks about snow around the world also um, talks about sort of you know, the, the average depth of the snow, the area covered by that type of snow. And you can actually see that if you put them together, we actually have similar volumes of these two types of snow over the world. So even though I might argue that, you know, my snow pit's a lot deeper than Matthew's snow pit, you know, mine's pretty isolated small mountain ranges, whereas the tundra is covering a huge area. You can also think about this in terms of, um, somebody mentioned an interest in snow and flooding. Right. If you, you look back at, um, let me go back. so if you if you look back here, if you know snow is melting everywhere in about five days, and you have the volume of snow over an incredibly large area, that shallow snowpack melting fast is going to cause substantial flooding. Whereas a deeper snowpack over a smaller area, actually taking longer to melt out is less likely to cause flooding. So you're thinking about how your snow is in space and time matters. So comparable volume. Um, maritime is deeper, but less area, longer snow melt season matters more for hydropower and water supply. And the tundra is shallow with more area, matters more for global albedo, permafrost, climate feedbacks, as well as out in prairie for flooding, that shallow snow that goes fast is important. 
Um, how are we generally in modeling snow all over the world? Um, this was a graphic that Drew Slater made for the 2014 class. And it shows uh, about 12 different products you could download that would tell you how much mean March snow water equivalent there is over a nine year period. And if you look at them, you can see the global products vary by 200%. So if you guys are struggling with your modeling, don't worry, the bar isn't very high right now and we can do better in this. End of this class, you guys can all help with our global snow modeling. Um, in terms of prioritization, also if you look at these graphs, there doesn't appear to be just one hotspot of problems. The models and products diverge across all of the Arctic and all of the mountains. And so wherever you're working, you have the potential to make snow modeling better. So part of what we talked about in this class is, this is a slide Mark Rowley put together um, when he finished his PhD. And um, he really wanted to ask the question of, how do we know what we think we know about snow? And it sounds a bit like the Piggy Eastman uh, graphic I showed you at the beginning. Um, so there's reality, right? There's snow out there. We go and we take ground observations, right? We go and we measure the snow. And if you, you take the January class, you'll learn all about how you do that. Um, we have remote sensing. There are a lot of people, um, particularly from Boise, working on the remote sensing aspect. And if you take um, HP's module next month, you'll learn more about that. And then there's snow models, which can be both at a point, which I showed you some traces, or could be spatially distributed across a large area. So now, you know, both ground observations and remote sensing are telling us something about reality, right? But both of them have a degree of uncertainty, right? You can see my, my picture of my MET station does not look happy in the snow. Uh, so, you know, we don't have enough measurements. Measurements we do has air. There's also a lot of spatial variability if you played in the snow. Um, the remote sensing, you know, people mentioned what's happening under the forest canopy, what's happening if there are clouds. We have a retrieval algorithm, right? We got a radiance back. How do we relate that? to something about snow. And we use both of these both to force our snow models. And we also have to put together our snow models, which have a bunch of parameters, have a specific structure. So we need to understand how our snow models work. In all of these, we ultimately just, just obtain partial confirmation. You understand the uncertainty and everything we try to get it better, but you want to you want to be cognizant that if your model doesn't match your observations, maybe because your model's terrible, maybe because your observation's terrible, or you might be exceedingly unlucky and both are terrible and they match perfectly and you're completely confused. You also need to think about scale over which each of these is running. Okay. So in trying to figure out this complicated world, um, this is a slide put together by Martin Clark, who, um, to quote T.C. Chamberlain, said that scientists often develop parental affection for their theories and for their models. And so the model we're going to be using is designed to not let you come up with too much affection. It doesn't mean you won't love it by the end of this class, it's just that you can't be um, too attached to any one way of modeling things. So. The idea is to come up with a method of multiple working hypotheses, where the idea is to bring up into view every rational explanation of a new phenomenon. So then the investigator becomes parent of a whole family of hypotheses. And by a parental relationship to all, you can't fasten your affections unduly upon anyone, right? When your kids ask you, do you love me better or my brother better? You, you can't pick one anymore, right? Or if you have one kid, of course you love that child better. So we'll be going to be using a modular modeling framework that embedded in it can be used to mimic a lot of different models and a lot of different modeling choices so that you can actually understand how models work under the hood without becoming too attached to any particular model. So what are the goals of this course? So number one, we're going to try to figure out what are the components of a snow model. Not, not a black box, we're gonna dig under the hood, what puts it together? How should you make decisions in constructing or choosing a snow model? How do you turn it on and run it? Right? There's the nuts and bolts of the computer. How do you run a snow model and test hypotheses using a snow model? 
once you've run it, how do you calibrate it and evaluate your snow model? And then how do you work through the critical thinking and detective work that's really required anytime you use any model? Um, the schedule is posted on the Canvas page. What we're going to do um, today, we're overviewing of the class and the snow modeling. Um, I want you to start the reading, which is basically the paper that details the model we'll be using in the class, and um, just post in the discussion or research profile. Basically, similar to what you all said when you, you talked, give me just a little bit more about why you're taking the class, and from what you heard from other people who you might have sort of virtually meet on this class who might help you have similar interests in you and your research. Um, on Monday, we will be diving into the meteorology, the forcing data for the snow model. Um, how do we make sure the data we have to start a model is good? Um, how do you drive the snow model? On Wednesday, we'll be adding vegetation. We'll put trees over the snow. How do we model that? Um, the reading critique will be due. Following week, we will go to turbulence over snow. We'll have albedo, boundary layer meteorology, and surface temperature. Then we're going to dive really into the details um, about what's, what's, what's inside that box. What is the structure of the model? How does it matter what you do with how many layers you put in the model? How you have vertical conductivity in the model? Um, then after diving into the details, we'll go out and talk about distributing a snow model across a whole watershed. And then finally, um, calibration and evaluation, you know, how if your model does or doesn't match your observations, how can you parse out what you're looking at? Um, the last day, um, we will be doing student presentations. Um, I'm going to show you how things work, and you're going to have a whole bunch of um, model experiments you can run, data you can play with. The homework is much less than what's capable of, and so based on your interests, I'm asking you to do one more thing. Um, I'll give you some examples as we go, and then um, do some presentations on what I did with the snow model. Any any questions on schedule or logistics on this part so far? You okay. All right. All right. Um, we already did make sure one can talk to everyone. Um, if, if you are having trouble with audio or the video, generally the chat box works at poor internet connections. The other things to be aware of is my email, um, outside of the whole canvas is jdlund at uw.edu. I won't get email while I'm lecturing, but if you have an emergency while I'm lecturing and the whole thing's shutting down and I'm talking to myself, you can also call my office number is right next to me, 206-685-7594. Also, my Skype ID is jessica.lundquist, in case Skype is working and nothing else is. Um, the, the goal is we're trying to connect, um, even though we're far away, so um, I'm here. Okay, so the first assignment is a research profile and a prep for the homework. So basically, um, I just want to make sure everybody can get on to Canvas and discussion board, um, post a few sentences about yourself and what you do. Uh, again, like just what you were talking about today. Um, also, who among students at other universities might be a good person to talk to in order to learn more that might help with your work? Um, who among other universities might you be able to help? Um, so again, thinking about how we can interface with each other. If, if you post some about yourself, it might help others answer these questions. So the goal is not just to post your own discussion, but also read what other people are posting. So we can get to know each other in virtual world. All right. So, um, all right, so I think, um, let's see what the easiest way. So I'm gonna sh step out of um, PowerPoint and show you a little bit. So basically the introduction file, and show you where it is, is going to take you through basic steps of how you're gonna set up accounts on HydraShare, GitHub, Python, and Jupyter Notebooks. It sounds overwhelming, but it's actually pretty easy. Um, so just a, a quick survey. If your video is on, raise your hand. Um, if not, I'm not sure if you can raise your hand sort of virtually here. Just put on your video and just you know, raise your hand. So who has used, thank you, 
Who's used HydraShare before? If you've used HydraShare, raise your hand. We've got uh, about 40% about of the class. Who has used GitHub before? Probably half the class. How about Python? Almost all the classes, wow. How about Jupyter Notebooks? Probably the same as the Python crowd. Okay. Um, if the, um, the only things you will, basically it will walk you through everything. We don't presume anybody knows any of these. So I'm going to escape, exit my show. All right. And I'm going to show you, let's see. All right. So the first thing, this is just to make sure we're getting you through all the things. So first, everyone should be able to get to the Kwasi Canvas page. So in the Kwasi, you should be able to get the assignments and basically they, they go through, um, the first one you have to turn in, so a reading critique, the research profile here says just to please answer basic things, go to the intro to computing. You go to the intro to computing, it basically, well, download a PDF, okay, I already have the PDF, but here it is. It will basically just walk you through step-by-step -step instructions, what you wanna do at each stage. So, um, HydraShare, blah, 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 blah. here's HydraShare. This is run by Kawasi. Basically, what we will use HydraShare for is to save your computing. Basically, you're going to be computing in the cloud. It's donated by Google for research and education. And at the end of the year, they're going to wipe off everything from the cloud. So if there's anything you like that you did on there, we will give you code that you can export it all to HydraShare, which is a place to save your work, and then you can download it, you can share it with each other. Um, once you have an ID on HydraShare, if you send it to me, I will invite you to be a member of the snow modeling group on HydraShare, and then um, you can more easily share files or find find things. Um, all right. When you walk through it, it will then you will create a GitHub account. Not because we are using GitHub, because it is the login credentials required to get into the virtual cloud computing machine. So what you're seeing now on my screen is, um, it's basically the virtual machine is hydro.pangeo.io. Um, the directions will walk you through how to get in there. It will walk you through how to clone a repository put together by Bart Nyson. He's another professor at the University of Washington to clone everything to your directory and um, then how to copy everything to a work directory, and then how to download forcing data for the modules we'll be doing. It has some details here on how to interface with Jupyter Notebooks and HydraShare, how to install Summa, and how to um, run the model in a PySumma framework. So there, there's, there's a lot of moving pieces, but if you just walk through them, it should be like cookbook following directions. For the people who are totally and completely new to Python, there's also a link in there. Um, the other class I'm teaching right now is data analysis in Python, and I give the link to basically what we put together are resources to learn Python page. Um, and so it just has a bunch of links videos. I would recommend that if you feel, um, I, I think the directions you should just be able to follow through even if you don't know Python, but if you want more, the resources are available. All right, the other thing while I'm here, um, I provided in an email link earlier, the link to the Quasi Snow Measurement Field School, um, which will be January 6th through 9th. And, um, and if you mark that you're in this class, they'll, They'll give you a um, higher priority because they know you love snow. Um, and then if you want to join the International Snow Note Sensing Working Group, I also give you that link. There's a button here at the bottom of the page. I don't know if you see my pointer or not. Anybody see my Raise your hand if you see my pointer. Yes, you can. Okay, excellent. 
Um, so there's a link that you can sign up. We're having an election soon, and if you join, you can vote. Um, so if you want to vote, join soon. If not, you can join whenever or don't join. Um, all right. That's my logistics on where everything is. Let me put this back. All right. Okay, so um, after you've figured out where things are and made accounts everywhere. Okay, so your first assignment is say who you are, make accounts everywhere. Your second assignment is to read a paper that Martin Clark put together about the SUMA model, which is a model we're going to be running. The paper is on Canvas. I'm also asking, it's a two-part paper, and I'm only asking you to read part two. You may want to open part one and just look at the pictures, um, but mainly I want you to read part two. Before you start reading this, I want you to know it's a very, very dense paper, so I don't expect you to focus on all of it. Please open the assignment in the directions, and it will say, like, really read this section. Some are much more relevant to snow modeling than others, and you'll save time if you just skim or skip the other sections. Um, make notes wherever you have questions. Um, the goal is that by the end of this month, this class and just doing modeling will answer your questions. But this is basically your background paper for the model you're going to be running. All right, so just to go over that one more time. Um, so go to meeting is where we are now. That's the lectures and discussions. Canvas is where you find all the course specific material and assignments. HydraShare is where you can save share all your model output or Python code for running the model, as well as forcing files, any work you do. That's your repository to save as long as you like. Um, GitHub does a lot of cool things, but for this class, it's only login authentication for web-based computing. Jupyter Notebooks is where you will modify SUMA configurations and set it up to run. Um, SUMA is actually written in Fortran, not in Python, so this is a wrapper just to run SUMA. Um, Pangeo and Google Cloud is where SUMA is installed and will actually run. And then a sense of humor is just what I ask you all to have if there are any bugs in this chain, right? <laughs> so, a lot of moving pieces in virtual world here. So, you know, please be patient and just ask me if anything comes up or causes you problems. Um, this is the second time doing this and everybody loved it last year. But that said, things can and probably will go wrong at some point. So hang in there. Um, all right. So does anybody... That's basically the all the logistics, and then I'll jump into um, what is a model, what is a snow model. Um, but I just want anything about logistics at all, if anyone has any questions. Um, just turn on your audio, or if, if you can't make it work, just type something in the chat box. I think it looks good. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? All right. Um, so, so the other thing, just to give you an idea of how I'm organizing files, um, is that because it's about an hour and a half class, my goal is to, um, to, to break things into modules. You'll see files will be saved for each day in the folder and in, in pieces. It'll be different pieces of PowerPoint, so you don't have to open a giant one. You can just open the piece you want to see. So this is 1.1, which is generally overview and logistics. And then you'll see 1.2, day one, part two, where we're going to jump into the snow modeling. Um, this is, you can also access the videos and zoom through there, and it might be helpful just to sort of see when I'm changing PowerPoints if you want to get to a certain point. OK. All right, so um, so let's let's jump into snow modeling. Um, so so this set of slides were put together by myself and by Bart Nyson, and the photo is from Matthew Sturm in Alaska. Uh, Matthew sends me lots of photos, and I love them, so I just stick them all in throughout the class. He he sent me this one and said, "Can your snow model do this?" And I said, "No." All right. Okay. So. Um, Another, another quote with people being affectionate to their, their model is that um, essentially all models are wrong, but some models are useful. So you know, what is a model? More specific to this class, 
A model is really a simplified or idealized description or conception of a particular system, situation, or process. It's generally described in mathematical terms, and then it's put forward as a basis for theoretical or empirical understanding or for calculations, predictions, etc. So again, when you think about your model, personally, I like to start with with drawing a a picture, right? What is in the world you're trying to represent and how can we represent that simply? Then from our picture, how can we write it in equations when we can start solving to make predictions and quantified calculations? Um, Why bother to model? Basically, there's, there's two main aims. One is to explore the implications of making certain assumptions about the nature of the real world. Um, The second is to predict the behavior of the real world system under a set of naturally occurring circumstances. A third might be just to understand if your conceptual model actually works, right? If if you envision it happening one way and build a model, does it look like reality? Um, We're trying to develop hypotheses that can be tested through observation experimentation. A model can also be really useful for just exploration. What if scenarios, right? What if all the snow goes away, does the soil completely freeze? Um, okay, so again, what is a model? When you're thinking about it, um, this is the onion diagram, right? So I just walked through all these different computers you can have to use just to run this model, right? At, at the basis, there's computer code, right? That you need to be able to use some programming language to, to work it. We won't dive too far into all of the underlying code. We'll mostly be doing a wrapper for the code. Um, There are the parameters of your model. Um, This is if people talk about calibrating their model, they're changing the parameters, right? How fast does albedo change with time is a parameter you have to put in. Um, These are things you change outside of the basic computer code. There's also the initial state. Um, For most of snow modeling, we'll presume that the snow, that if we're doing seasonal snow, we can generally start with the new water year, which by the way, happy new water year. Yesterday was our new year, right? Um, Initial state, we start with zero snow, it accumulates and it melts again, so snow goes back to zero. However, for people interested in the soil moisture, right, if it rained before the snow came, your initial state would be your soil is wet before the snow fell on it. So you'd wanna make sure that you had a good initial state of your model. Then there's the forcings, right? What what are the things that are happening? When does it rain or snow? What's the temperature? What's the solar radiation? And so, you know, all of these go into how well your model will work or will not. Um, there's the stages of a model simulation where particularly where that initial condition matters, you need a spin up. Um, so you basically, particularly if you have like something with storage with a lot of groundwater, if you're trying to build a glacier, something that takes time, you'll do a lot of simulations just trying to get at the basic initial state. Once you get to that model initial state, then you run your basic simulation. Again, for, um, which will then get to your model state that you're trying to analyze. Again, for seasonal snow, we generally don't have to worry about this. Um, We start with zero snow and move forward. Um, However, for glaciers and hydrology, we need to really be cognizant about soil, water, and ice. And I noticed a lot of people were talking about interests in soil and groundwater related to snow. And so for those of you who really need to think about the spin up, um, the model we run does have all the soil parameters in it and prior soil storage. So if that matters to you, you want to run the model for a while until it seems to come in equilibrium, take the initial state, and then run your actual simulation. So things to think about as we're modeling, um, we need to combine our models and observations. We have to choose our model architecture, develop the parameters, specify the model parameters, specify the model forcings, decide how to evaluate it. So let's start about our model architecture. What are the types of models we might want to choose for doing snow modeling? So the the basic ones that we've been using in the Western US for the longest time are data-driven. This is where you infer relationships from the observations without really attempting to describe the underlying causal processes. An example would be a statistical model. This is what's used um, for a lot of um, water districts in the Western US. 
is the NRCS goes out and measures how much snow there is in the spring. And there's a regression model between maximum snow accumulation and summer stream flow. Another example might be a stochastic time series model, which is a weather generator. You, know, you have a 50% chance of it raining any given day. Um, another example might be machine learning, right? We're just going to look through all the data and see what correlates with something else and make a prediction without worrying about why. So here's somebody got a question. I think it was just a audio. All right, so here's an example of the first type. Um, this, this is in the archive 1953 publication, Streamflow Forecasting from Snow Surveys by R.A. Work, the Snow Survey Project Supervisor. And um, the, the first thing you notice is that um, in 1950s, they wrote much nicer than most of the uh, papers we're reading today. Winter snow quietly sifting down in remote forest places normally provides much of the life-giving water needed by thirsty Western lands. The hum of power lines and the whirring wheels of industry reflect each melting flake. So um, besides better poetry, you can see that basically they are taking the yearly maximum snow water equivalent, measuring that, and then using that to forecast how much runoff you're going to get later in the season. Right? It's a simple um, statistical model um, along with air bounds. What's the uncertainty of predicting your runoff from your snow? Here's a picture of people doing snow surveys from the same paper. Um, another example is Snow 17. How many people have ever heard of Snow 17? Just one? So, so Snow 17 is actually used operationally. So the um, prior one I just showed you is used operationally by um, most water resource predictions for people doing agriculture. Snow 17 is actually used by the National Weather Service River Forecasting Center for most flood forecasting. So Snow 17 is a conceptual model. Um, most of the important physical processes take place in the model, but only a very simplified form. So basically Snow 17 is an index model that uses air temperature as the sole meteorology to determine the energy exchange across the snow air interface. Besides temperature, the only other input variable for forcing you to run the model is precipitation. So here is, um, again, it's a conceptual model because it doesn't try to include all of the physics. It just tries to include the most important parts where you know, you precipitation and temperature, is it rain or is it snow? If it's rain, you have some rain plus melt that's going to go to outflow. If it's snow, you're going to accumulate some snow. You're going to figure out the energy exchange, figure out whether or not it has a deficit, is the snow too cold? If um, if there, it's not cold, it overcomes um, not too cold, then you get liquid water, transmission of liquid water goes to ground melt, and it goes to outflow to your river. Um, basically all of these processes are indexed to the air temperature. The air temperature determines what happens. And the final one, which is what we'll be looking at in this class is a physically based, which um, and Bart put in the caveat, physically motivated. Um, the reason is because a physically based model tries to represent causal relationships as much as possible through a direct description of the underlying physical processes. But in reality, we don't know the physics equation for everything. So generally, there are other pieces in there. It's not all physics. Um, examples of things that are really physically based might be a ballistics model that's all physics. Um, the Richards equation for variably saturated flow to describe transport in the Vedo zone, or the St. Venet equations for a 1D transient open channel flow, right? Something that's just very much, this is the physics we know from fluid mechanics and laws of the atmosphere. Um, the distinct, real distinction between conceptual and physically based models is not always clear cut, and it's also often a function of scale. So um, you'll, you'll notice that sometimes if you're writing a, a proposal or a paper, people will say, oh, well, you didn't use a physically based model. And really, most models are some of each. Um, you can say your model isn't physically based either. If you want. So here's an example. This is output from the SUMA model. Um, and so it's physically based trying to really represent depth and density all the way throughout instead of just having a bulk variable. 
All right, so this just shows most models contain elements of all three approaches. Any questions just in general, what we're thinking about with modeling? Pretty okay. All right, let's use that one and go to my final one here. All right. Okay, so now, um, so this, this set of slides was primarily put together by Martin Clark, who is the one who, um, who wrote the architecture for the SUMA model. And so this is about, you know, as you're building a model, what are the decisions that you need to make to, to put it together? If you're actually going to write the code at the heart of a model and all the pieces to the model, which we're not going to do, but what, what did he have to think about step by step to do this? So for this, we'll talk about the necessary ingredients of any model for modeling in general. Then I'd talk about it in terms of both the temperature index snow model, that's like snow 17 I just showed you, as well as a really basic hydrology model. Then talk about how these ingredients apply to physically motivated snow modeling. What are the big decisions that have to be made if you're putting your model together? And then you know, what are, what's the impact of those key model development decisions? Sort of what is the general philosophy underlying SUMA? So a lot of things you'll see here are similar to what you'll see in the first reading I ask you to do. All right, so let's start with just the ingredients of a model. So, so the first thing in the ingredients of the model, as I mentioned before, the definition of a model is um, both, both Bart and Martin really like to talk about modeling as the art of modeling um, and I'm a visual learner and so I start anytime I'm doing anything if I just try to draw a picture of how the world works so this is Martin's version of how the world works um, and he says you know it, it rains it snows there's snow on trees it goes down you know, what are all the things you think are important um, so in thinking about your system I'm going to ask you as, as part of the homework with reading to draw your picture of how you think the world works and how you think the, the SUMA model works. So you start with an art, like what are the dominant processes? What do you care about? What, what needs to be in your model? And in your picture, you need to define the things in terms of first state variables. So these are things that are states of the system, right? It's a storage term. There's a storage of water or storage of energy. And then second, fluxes, right? These are exchanges of water, exchanges of energy. And these affect how the state variables change in time. All right, so again, state variables represent storage, right? That's the state of the system right now. Um, you know, how much, I was told how much you have in your bank account, um, mass, energy, momentum. State variables evolve over time, and the state at time t is a function of states at previous times, right? If you make a withdrawal in your bank account, it goes down. Um, you must include a model initial state, right? You either have zero snow to start, zero soil moisture, something you need to define that says initial conditions need to be defined for your state variables. Okay, so you guys have your video on, awesome. Um, if you don't, consider turning your video back on. Um, tell me what you think are some key state variables in a snow model. Uh, snow water equivalent in depth. I heard both of those. Yep. That's, you know, storage, right? How much snow you have? What's your snow water equivalent? What else? What about the uh, cold content of a snowpack? Right. The cold content of the snowpack, which might be represented as the temperature of a layer. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Anything else? energy available for the snow to melt like this. So that, that's a, a good a good thing to bring up. So there's there's the internal energy of the snowpack, which is basically how cold it is right now. Now the energy available mm -hmm. for the melt is going to be a flux. So right that's something that's coming in. So that would not yes so that would be a flux. So these are just state variables right now. So it's very important changes. Okay. 
difficult, but it's not great very long. So I heard, I heard depth, I heard sweet, I heard internal energy or temperature. Anything else? The ground condition or what the soil's doing? Yeah, so there's, there's this soil moisture, like the soil has a temperature, the soil has a water content, right? It's state variables for the soil, absolutely. Um, how about the moisture holding capacity of the air? So, so I think that's, that is a state variable for the air. And I think that, that that brings up a good question of how are you defining your modeling system? So, um, so if we go back to my, my little square I had on the first page, so if we're, we're modeling the snow or the snow plus the soil, we then sort of draw a box around what we're modeling and we would say then that the, the atmosphere is a floor scene that comes and acts on it so if we had a coupled atmosphere land model then the aspects of the air would would evolve too does that make sense so our model we're going to start we're going to have typical hydrology we're going to pretend that meteorology lives outside of our domain and so we're not going to update all the states of the atmosphere However, you had a couple, like climate model, you would want to do both, right? So climate model has states of the land surface and states of the atmosphere. And so the moisture in the air would then be a state variable in that model. Make sense? The one other thing I was thinking of would be density or um, liquid water content. Just, you know. All right. Can you okay. clarify what? Um, you say that one more time. <laughs> clarify what? It went bad. And now I can't hear whoever is just talking. And maybe Katie is trying to talk. I, I we can't hear. You can type if you go to the like chat box. If you have a question, you can type it in. Um, oh, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, we were getting we got two people in a room, so we've been um, we had some feedback on our end. But I was curious if you could clarify um, what um, like how momentum is represented as a storage, um, just a little bit more, and like what an example of that would be for these types of models. So, in all honesty, for a snow model we don't worry about momentum at all <laughs> so where you would do momentum is if you were doing um stream like a stream going downstream that the the velocity because an object in motion tends to stay in motion you, it's a state variable right but the motion or the if you had an avalanche of it falling down you would have to act upon the velocity with a force to change it in terms of the snow we are not going to do avalanche modeling and so we are not going to update momentum at all in this class. But if there was an avalanche falling, the speed at which it was falling before you acted on it would be a state variable that you need to consider in the initial condition. Does that make sense? Okay, awesome. All right, so um, so some fluxes. So you know, if our, our state variable we're thinking is about you know, sort of characteristics of our snow model and the soil underneath it that, is go that are going to evolve in time, um, the fluxes represent an exchange or transport, right? It's a rate of flow of a property per unit area, and it only depends on the quantities at time t. So, so if you, for example, want to melt the snow by making the sun come up, you're going to have a flux of solar energy coming. It's, you know, can be zero before the sun comes up. Once the sun comes up, it can be what it is right now. It doesn't matter whether the sun was out the minute before or not. It's just how much solar radiation is hitting your snowpack right now. Um, so the rate of change of state is associated with one or more fluxes that are different from zero, right? So, so it, for example, when I, we talk about momentum, an object in motion wants to stay in motion. You need to have some flux. You have something act upon it to change it. Um, if our snow is very, very cold, we want our snow to warm up, something needs to act upon it, right? We need a flux of energy into or out of the snowpack to change that state. So um, tell me what you think are the key fluxes in a snow model. I gave you the example of solar radiation from the sun. What else might there be? 
Long wave radiation. Long wave radiation, yeah. Precipitation. Mm-hmm. Melt. Melt, yeah. A decrease in your stored water. Uh, the the vapor pressure and the wind velocities. Mm-hmm. Those are gonna vapor pressure in the air. Yeah, that will relate to the turbulent fluxes, right? The, the winds and the vapor pressure are going to create a gradient and cause turbulent fluxes. Absolutely. Sublimation? Sublimation, yeah. And there's a flux of, of your uh, mass to the atmosphere from the snow. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, so I think I think you got most of them. And uh, if not, they'll show up once we start pulling up all our equations. So, so let's let's look at these ingredients. Let's start before we get into our more complicated model. Let's start with a temperature index snow model. Let's see if we can you know, have an idea of how that works. Let's see if we can write down all the parts and label them of what parts they are in a model. Okay, so here's here's our state equation. So here we're gonna call S is snow storage. It's we're gonna measure in millimeters. Our fluxes are accumulation, so accumulation in millimeters per day, and melt, no melt in millimeters per day. So the state equation is the change in snow storage per unit time is equal to snow accumulation minus the snow melt. So we've got our state variable, right, our snow storage. The state variable is also sometimes referred to as the prognostic variable. We have our fluxes, right, we can accumulate but we can melt, as you guys mentioned, are the key forces, fluxes. And then we have some flux parameterizations and some model parameters. So we have a state equation tells us basically how we think the world works, right? What, what do we care about storage? What do we think are fluxes that might add or subtract to storage? And then we have to say, okay, well, how are we actually going to define snow accumulation and snow melt, right? So those are the parameterizations and the model parameters. So now we've got our model forcing, right? So P is the precipitation rate, some millimeters per day. Uh, TA is the air temperature, which we're going to define in degrees Kelvin. And then we have some parameters. This kappa is a melt factor. And we have a physical content. Con physical constant TF is the freezing point. So, um, so you can see where these components come from. The precipitation and the air temperature both come from the forcing data, right? So presumably you got that from a weather model or you measured it at a weather station. You have a model parameter. So you need some way of coming up with, you know, how much melt should occur per degree Celsius, right? So you have a parameter that you have to use to relate things. And then you have a physical constant the freezing point, which could also be treated as a model parameter. So we say we accumulate if precipitation falls with air temperature less than the freezing point. We don't accumulate if it falls air temperature greater than the freezing point. If the temperature is less than the freezing point, no melt occurs. And if temperature is greater, then we have some melt factor, which is the parameter we're going to come up with. Any questions on all the components here? Pretty straightforward. Um, then we need, after we've defined all these, how our model works, we need a numerical solution. So in this case, it's very simple because the fluxes do not depend on the state variables. So, um, so you don't need to worry about the amount of snow change depending on how much snow there was in the first place. This is going to change when we get into soil parameters. Okay. So few more just definitions in modeling. Um, in any model, you'll see both prognostic and diagnostic equations and variables. So prognostic is any equation or variable at time t that's dependent on values at the previous time. Diagnostic is an equation or variable at time t that is dependent only on values at time t. So actually it becomes very important in how you can parallelize your code versus not 
Um, so you can either use the chat box or you can just turn on your microphone, whatever is easier. Um, tell me whether this equation, change in snow storage per unit time equals accumulation minus melt, is this a prognostic or a diagnostic equation? And if you think it's not that simple, maybe what, what you're thinking about. Got one vote for diagnostic. Most I vote that it's not that simple. Um, it depends like, on whether you're modeling snow at like a current time or if you're met if you're projecting or forecasting snow. I think, let's see, where did, where did I just get pardon? It's depend, so, so let, let's, yeah, let's break it down. So, um, so prognostic means, I think we're, 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 because I've given you definitions of equation or variable, and then I just wrote something down. I think I need to be a little more specific here about what I'm talking about, right? So, the, the, in this model, the change, the change in snow per unit time, if I consider the whole thing at one, that, that change, is that prognostic or diagnostic? I think that's diagnostic, right? Because that just depends on the current step as this model was written. Now, what about the the variable? What about the snow storage? Is that prognostic or diagnostic? The snow is uh, prognostic. Yeah. The snow depth that change in storage. Right, right. So the change in this case is, is diagnostic. But the total amount of snow you have is prognostic, right? It depends on the snow you had yesterday, how much snow you had today. Yeah, so you, you want to kind of be careful, and it, it's not that simple as well. Is there any, any questions on, on that? Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Now, just a few more definitions. Um, parameter, he specifies the shape of the function. And your four scenes. Um, so, in, in the case of the melt model, our parameter gave us the slope of the line, right? How fast does melt change per change in temperature? And then your four scenes are time varying boundary conditions. And, and that's why when I, we talked about state variables, and someone said, well, how much the moisture in the atmosphere? You, you have to define with any model what are the boundaries of your model? Where are you going to calculate and keep track of things? And where are you going to impose an external four scene? So um, here again, here's our model parameter, here's our forcing data, here's our physical constant. So um, in thinking about it in terms of parameterizations, and this is where it gets, gets a little gnarly when people say they're doing physically based modeling and the model must be right because it's physically based. In, in many, many cases, the full description of the underlying physics is just not possible. Either we just don't understand what's happening well enough or there's a trade-off between the physical realism and the computational demand. Like what you, even though computers keep getting better, they still, um, you know, can't keep track of, you know, every single grain of sand moving down the river at every point in time. Um, so really, rather than describe physical processes explicitly, we try to mimic the behavior of the system and its main causal relationships with a parameterization. Um, in in general, this. This does this helps us make the computer go, but it doesn't solve a lot of problems because a lot of times we have problems coming up with these parameters. And so what we'll be doing in the modeling is you can change these parameters and see what happens. Um, so, so we just gave this example. Here's a parameterization of modeling snowmelt based on air temperature. So um, 
Can somebody give me an example of either a pro or a con related to our parameterization we've just put in our temperature index snow model here? What might be a really good thing about it? It's really simple to implement. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take a whole lot of computation. They've been running this operationally for a long time. The data is available widely. Yeah, the, the temperature is one of the easiest things to measure, right? You'll find out that if you start parameterizing things based on long wave radiation, no one actually measured long wave radiation, and you just use temperature to make up long wave radiation. Is that any better than just using temperature? Yeah, very good. Anything else? All right, so now um, let, let's take these concepts we have for a basic snow model. And we're gonna have another simple model, but this one's slightly different in that, and this is the horrible thing, now S does not represent snow, it's a storage of water. So here's a conceptual hydrology model. State equation is a change in storage of water per unit time is equal to precipitation minus evaporation minus runoff probably seen in this in basic hydrology classes quite a bit. Okay, so here's our state equation, which I just showed you. Here's our state variable. This is our, our soil storage, our basin water storage, our forcing data. And then we have two fluxes, right? Evapotranspiration or base flow out. Now here, in the case of a simple hydrology model, here are our flux parameterizations. Um, so potential, evapotranspiration, we probably got from our forcing data, right? That's how much energy there is available to evaporate the water. And then the actual amount depends on um, both a number of model parameters, as well as our state variable. So you notice a big difference between this simple model and the snow simple model we just did is that in this model, the fluxes themselves depend on the state of the water. Does that make sense? Right? That if there's, you know, if there's no water in the soil, evapotranspiration is going to be zero, right? If there's more water in the soil, evapotranspiration is going to go up. You, you could also see this happening a little bit in, um, you know, sublimation from the surface of the snowpack, right? If the surface the temperature of the surface of the snowpack is actually going to control the flux for sublimation, which is then going to control the temperature of the snowpack. That, that makes sense? The amount of runoff depends on how much water there is in the soil. All right, this is a very important thing to notice in models in that in the cases that your flux depends on your state variable, you must be very careful with your numerical solution. So you can calculate very, if you take too large of a time step or you change your state variable too much, the flux itself may change and be wrong. So we're not going to dive into the details of this in this class, but I want everyone just to be aware of it when you're choosing your models and if your models are doing weird things, there are a lot of models out there that are used for research hydrology and snow modeling that do not properly have, don't have proper numerical solutions in them and can have what Martin calls numerical demons that come to haunt you um, if you start um, doing time stepping incorrectly. Um, I'm not gonna go into it, but just be aware that if your state variables and your fluxes, you, you want to step back and, and be careful. Um, all right, so um, so it's 320. People have been in these classes. Are people ending? I know you dub, we always stop at 10 minutes the hour so you can run to your next class. Are people taking the full hour and a half? Do you want me to keep talking? Do you want me to stop talking? <laughs> Is there any protocol for these quasi classes? What do people think? Do 
Keep, keep talking. Nobody's going to run on. All right. All right. I have just a few more, more slides. I will try to end it between 3.20 and 3.30 each day. Okay. All right. So just to put together everything, um, everything we talked about today, how do we, we deal with the general modeling problem? So we start with a general schematic. So here, just for example, is a schematic of the terrestrial water cycle with the dominant fluxes of water and energy. Um, when Martin started putting together the SUMA model, he was looking at lots and lots of other models. Part of the reason I showed you the numerical demons was um, I, I kept asking him, I was having trouble in running models, and I would run the model on two different computers and come up with different answers, and I thought I did it the same. I thought I was going mad. It was time-stepping issues and rounding errors on computers. Um, and, and so basically he said that, you know, most hydrologic modelers actually share a common understanding of this picture. Most people, when you ask, like, what are the fluxes? What are the state variables? would come up with something, you know, maybe they draw trees differently. But, you know, they come up with something similar to this picture. And so we agree, for the most part, about the dominant fluxes of water and energy. Um, this, this allows us to formulate a general governing model of equations for um, for different subdomains. For some reason, this is not liking me. There we go. Um, the governing equations, the basic physics we all agree on, we all understand, are scale invariant. However, a lot of people, there's also parts of modeling people really disagree. And these are key modeling decisions that relate to the spatial discretization of the model domain. How big should it be? How should you drive things up? Um, how you parameterize individual fluxes? Um, what parameter values you put in? And then the numerical solution, how do you actually solve the equations? So the goal was to develop a unifying model framework that just had one set of the governing equations that everybody agreed on, and then had the capability for people to actually change, modular, swap out all the things that people disagree on. So you could try your favorite, you could try your friend's favorite, you could see which one actually worked better without changing the core part. That most models prior to this, like you would get two models, you could compare them, but they would have 20 things different and you wouldn't know why they'd be giving you different answers. The goal is for education's sake and understand modeling, you can change one thing at a time. And that's why I really like this for teaching. I don't use this model in all applications, but for trying to understand, I really like this model to try to understand why things are working. All right, so if we're taking that great basic framework, okay, here's snow. How should we simulate dominant processes in this environment? What are the things we're absolutely sure on that everybody's going to agree? What, what things, we look, this is our snow, we're gonna model this right here. What, what are things that absolutely most important you think everybody would agree on? Uh, the melting temperature of snow. The melting temperature of snow? Yep, probably zero degrees, we're there. Okay, we got that. What else we need in our model? We oh, need forcing we? data. Yeah, we, we're all gonna agree we need forcing data, right? We need some snowfall to get that temperature somewhere. That is absolutely, everybody's gonna need that. Um, what might we disagree on? What might you do with it? Yeah. add solar radiation to what we might agree on well i mean we might want a temperature index model right sorry but, i didn't hear that and we, we might want to just model it based on temperature that, oh yeah yeah i mean so solar radiation we might say that's essential we absolutely need it um but someone else might say no i don't think so so here are a few things that i said like we probably most what we really Gonna say we need snow accumulation. We're all gonna need that snow melt. We need something to do about the snow. Now we get into details. Might be exactly: Do we you model drifting and avalanching? Do we model a rain snow transition? Do we model the energy flux for the snowpack, the meltwater flow? Do we model grain growth, snow compaction? Like, how detailed do we we really want to get? And then, what information do we really need? We need model forcing data. Um, you know, Megan might say we all agree we need shortwave radiation. 
And then we probably need some model parameters. So for each of the processes we want to include, we probably need you know, something that's going to include how it evolves through time. So um, with five minutes left, I'm going to go back into these equations later. I'm going to put them up so you can see them, but we will we'll be going into these more. So, so briefly, things that everybody can agree in physics, everybody knows thermodynamics is a very well-established field. We all agree that changes in temperature plus changes in phase are going to be um, equal to the sum of fluxes at the boundaries. We also agree in just the mass balance, right? The changes in liquid water plus changes in phase are going to be fluxes in liquid water at the boundaries, as well as changes in ice. You might change phase, right? Go between liquid and ice in our snowpack as well as if we're doing a volumetric ice content, which that includes your density would be compaction of how much it goes down. It's going to equal the fluxes of the boundaries. So these are things that are grounded in physics that most people couldn't argue, right? They say, okay, yeah, that actually is the right physics equation. Um, within this model, um, the fluxes in SUMA are only defined in the vertical dimension. So you might argue there's going to be blowing snow into my domain. That's not going to be in this particular model. So there's no, no lateral exchange of water and energy among elements. We're going to pretend we have isolated vertical columns. Um, spatial variability can be represented through spatial variability in the model forcing. So you could actually have non-homogeneous -homo precipitation represented as drift factors. So if you think like there's always this drift, you know, downhill, you just say to the model, more snow falls here. You parameterize it outside of the model. Um, most snow models have equations that look like this. We'll be getting back to these equations. Once you have the equations, you need to decide how are we going to disparatize the model domain? Um, are we going to do grids all over? What, what's the shape and size of these grids? How do we want to set them up? And then how many layers do we need in our snow model? Do we just have one layer? Do we think we need five layers, 50 layers? Um, if we, we decided we were only gonna deal with one column at a time, but what about you know, temperature gradient fluxes through there might be different. We'll be experimenting with layering experiments. And then um, how should we parameterize the model fluxes and the properties? How should we handle the forcing data? Um, our first, um, Computing experiment, we will be playing with the forcing data and see what that does to the snow. Um, what are our parameterizations of the fluxes of the energy balance? How, how do we represent long wave if we didn't measure it, for example? We'll do that in class. Um, how do we represent the way temperature is transferred between layers? How do we represent snow albedo? How do we represent atmospheric stability, which is a parameter that goes into those um, flux terms? How do we represent the thermal conductivity? What, what should it be? And then just as an example, here's a um, parameter and prioritization for the albedo. Um, what you might be concerned here then is this is the amount of snow necessary to refresh albedo. What is that? Where should you find it? What's the albedo decay rate? And what's the minimum albedo? So even after you come up with an equation that defines how albedo changes, there's a lot of things you still have to put in it. All right. Um, I will go into the time-stepping schemes, um, and I will leave you next time. I will leave you with the SUMA horrendogram, um, which Martin decided is a horrendogram, which again is the idea that there's the core that we agree on, which is those basic mass and thermal balance. And then there are all the things that go into it. And there's the parts we disagree on. And these are model options. And so these are things you can change and put into the model. And we'll be diving into this more, but this is kind of the framework we're going to be working on in this class. It's 3.30, so I am going to um, 
push stop on the recording. And if anyone has any questions, um, I'm not sure if I even can push stop on the recording. Pause. Please stop the recording.